I suppose it doesn't really matter if you could throw it on social media, that'd be great. Um, right, so get, get, I want to kick off, and I want, I want to kick off by with a story. Um, it's a story that had a huge impact on my life, and it's a story about a question. I might have talked about Tim Ferriss here a few times. Tim Ferriss is um, he's a guy from America. He's like a podcaster, a self-help guy, a really smart guy, all about the questions, asking the good questions, an amazing interviewee, certainly known as the Oprah Winfrey of podcasting. And I'd be a big fan of Tim Ferriss, a big fan of his work and how he actually interviews people and dissects tools, tactics, and routines of some of the most successful people in the world. And what happened to Tim Ferriss in, in 2018, I think it was, he was struggling with some of his own difficulties in life. He was, um, a couple of his friends died in quick succession. He was had some sort of financial difficulties, mental health issues. And he was saying to himself, he was, he was struggling to cope. And he started asking himself certain questions. Am I fulfilling my life purpose? Am I doing the right thing? And he was at, he's a big, big fan, big fan of questions. And he was saying to himself, what, is my life going in the right direction? Am I wasting my life? He was asking himself all these questions. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, he came across this one question. And what, what, way, what way he framed this question? So instead of looking at the solutions, trying to pull the problems apart and stuff like that, he, he changed that question on its head. And he said, what would this look like if it were easy? And I've got to say this again because it's important. It's a, it's a monster question in my life. What would this look like if, with, if it were easy? With this being the problem that you're experiencing at a certain moment in time. So Tim Ferriss' problem was he was uh, mentally struggling, he was financially struggling, and a couple of other struggles as well. So he journaled, and I'm going to be talking about uh, answering questions today. If you really want to answer questions in a big way and get answers and pull this stuff apart, I'm going to be talking about dis how to dissect your, your questions now. In a, in, a, in a while as well but journaling is the best way and people start to get confused with journaling journaling is simply here we go pen and paper i could write a question at the top of this post it and i start writing down anything that comes to my head you can journal on a post it you can journal anywhere journaling is simply writing writing what comes into your head that's simply all it is so a lot of these questions it's great to journal on these things by just writing the question at the top of the page and writing the answers that come down so that's what tim ferris done with that question what would this look like if it were easy? Now, what happened there was, this is a very generic kind of question. So it's more of a brain dump onto a page. You just throw everything onto a page. Sometimes you ask specific questions, which I'll be going into in a, few, in a, in a while. But sometimes you just ask these vague questions and they were brain dump onto the page. And basically, mad things were coming onto the page for Tim Ferriss. Things like, I actually don't know what was going onto the page, but lo loads of garbage was coming out onto the page. But what happened was, and Tim Ferriss knew this, when you journal on certain questions, sometimes one little thing, 2% of what's on the page, you can get, it can be the little nugget that you're actually looking for. And the one answer that jumped out with Tim Ferriss was, I would have a tribe of mentors to help me with all of my different struggles. Now, what happened from that was, that was like a, a, a light bulb going off in Tim Ferriss's head. And he was like, what if I had my own tribe of mentors? So all of a sudden, the wheels started turning. And he says, I could write a book about this. I could reach out to all of these mentors of mine, ask them the questions that I'm struggling with in life, put them all together, get the answers, and write a book about it at the same time. So that's what he done. And in 2019, I think it was, his book came out, Tribe of Mentors, which is an absolute masterclass of a book with life advice from 130 of the world's leading performers in around spirituality, around business, around psychology, around all of this, loads of self-help gurus as well, actors, Aaron Schwarzenegger's in there, a very wise guy actually. <clears throat> so that's what Tim Ferriss got. He said, what would this look like if it were easy? And the answer came to him, he had a tribe of mentors. And then he got that tribe of mentors, wrote a book, and that book has sold millions of copies, and he is basically giving that life advice to everyone in the world. It's a book that's very close to my heart. I would highly, highly, highly recommend a tribe of mentors. Um, now, why that had such a big impact on my life? I was going through my own struggles um, um, a couple of, I think it was around the same time. I just bought the book. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a bit sketchy on the years then. So Tim Ferriss' book must be in 2007 then, because I, I think I was, struck, I was having a little struggle around 2008 then. So but the problem I was having, I had started public speaking at this stage. So I'd never, I'd, never, I'd, only, I'd only begun to do a bit of public speaking. I was doing a couple of talks and skills. And I remember going to Blackrock College and I went in and was talking to the guys in Blackrock College and they'd be from um, an upper, upper class environment. And I remember saying to myself, there's a couple of the kids listening and I was saying, right, they're hearing my story about anxiety, about addiction. 
And some of them, most of them were listening. I'm saying to myself, why would they be listening to some addict with anxiety over the north side that doesn't can't, they can't really relate to this guy? That's, that's what I was thinking, and it made perfect sense. So I remember thinking to myself, how can I engage these people? Because I knew I was sharing life skills that were very, very valuable and got me out of a huge hole and that lifted me not only out of a hole, but helped me to thrive in life. And when these guys knew it or not, they were fairly privileged. They would all have challenges at some stage in their life. And this got me thinking about how can I get through to all kids? How can I get through to all the kids in these different schools? And I started wondering to myself, right, what, what would this look like if it were easy? Because I was reading Tim Ferriss's book and I started saying, what would this look like if it were easy? And I remember journaling on this question and I was stupid things co coming into my head. Like I could jump into their heads and know what they want. I could implant things into their head. Like I mean, garbage was coming out onto the page and uh, loads of other silly things. But then all of a sudden, I couldn't believe it, it just popped into my head. I need my own tribe of mentors. If I was Brian O'Driscoll's buddy, a rugby head, going off to Blackrock College, and I was saying, Brian O'Driscoll shared this thing with me, these guys would be listening. And the whole, I suppose the whole celebrity thing and the whole association with people you know, young people buy into that. That's why advertising works so well and they pay a fortune for all these celebrities and all these top performers. Because advertising through association. So I thought I remember thinking to myself, right, I need a tribe of mentors. And I asked myself that very same question. And how it had such a big impact on my life. I, I wasn't Tim Ferriss. I hadn't got access to, to celebrities and access to um, top leading business people or anything like that. So I actually just decided to craft an email. I, I remember looking up on the internet and um, the top 25 influential people in Ireland, top 25 influential women, top 25 influential men, all these little lists start coming up. And I start getting an idea of who influential people, top performers in Ireland were. And I started trying to get in touch with agents of uh, sports people and stuff like that. So when I crafted an email. I was ridiculously honest in the email. I poured my heart onto a page. I've since done a retrospective analysis of why that email worked so well. And it was really interesting that they seen I had a mission. I, 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 I created a sense of intrigue. But it was my authenticity. I just poured myself onto the page. I think I said, I'm a ridiculously enthusiastic learner. I was an addict. I'm now in Trinity College doing this. I'd love you to give me the skills that you've learned in your life so I can share with the world and share with young people. And what came of that was an 80% success rate. I cold emailed many of Ireland's leading CEOs, Mick Slane, who I know, I got in touch with Mick through the, that email and I got that banner. Mick's now a good friend of mine. We meet months a month. He gives me great advice on life and career and stuff like that. So, um, Basically, I reached out to all these, these leading CEOs in Davy Group and AIB, Air, all of these leading companies. And I got, it's, I went and I interviewed these guys. I got their life advice, which I'm going to be writing another book about in the future. But another better thing came from that um, was like I got the tools and I shared these tools and skills as well. But another great thing that came out was the connections that I built. And I ended up meeting people that were very great human beings that just wanted to help other people as well. And it was a fascinating experience. And what came of that in one particular meeting, Carolyn Lennon gave me an opportunity to speak in air. That was my first corporate gig. Mick gave me another opportunity to speak in Robus, um, Robus LED Line. That was my second corporate gig. But then Bernard Bourne, who was CEO of AIB at the time, invited me in for a huge, um, a huge talk in AIB. He invited a uh, hundred of the top execs in AIB um, and it was recorded for 10,000 of the staff within AIB. I remember I, like, there's a whole section of my book about talking about this and I was all over the place. My nerves were gone. And But I went in there, I done the talk well and that led to that talk basically launched the speaking career I had today. So from that one question, Tim Ferriss's question, what would this look like if it were easy? It created a book for Tim Ferriss that he shared around the world. And it created a speaking career for me. It's the reason why I'm sitting here today talking about these life skills now today. It's the reason why in the last eight weeks I've been doing seminars for my own secondary school, for other schools, for all the colleges, well, not all the colleges, some of the colleges, Trinity College and NCI. And that's the reason was because of that one question. That was the importance of that question in two of our lives, and um, mine and Tim Ferriss's lives. That's the impact that has had. Uh, incredible impact. So what I would say, if there's anything, I'm going to be talking about a lot of questions tonight and a lot of things around asking yourself questions, but that is, I think, is the most potent question you can ask yourself to do a brand up. So whatever problem you're having in life, ask yourself, what would this look like if it were easy? And don't get this hard and the silly answers are coming out the page. Just keep on dumping onto the page. And sometimes just some, a little seed just jumps out from there 
and and you can see um, you can see where um, where that might take you. It's a really really potent question. And it's a way it's a way of reframing a problem in terms of elegance. I think instead of simplicity, looking for the solution instead of looking for to solve the problem. It's a different way of looking at looking at looking at it. So I'm going to um, I'm going to go through a couple of questions now. Um, let me see. I'm going to go through a couple of questions that have had um, a massive impact in my life. I'm going to be sharing all these questions, guys. Um, I'm going to be sharing these questions in the newsletter next week So I'm gonna, and, the, and the idea behind them. And first, I'm going to go through a couple of questions that have been pivotal in my own life. And they... Let's make sure I'm still on there. Yeah. They've been pivotal in my own life. And I ask myself these questions on a regular basis. And let me just... Make this smaller. One sec. There we go. Just was starting that out beforehand. Right. So these questions simply are the four the fourth one. It's a great question, and I'd advise you is if you're big on these questions, guys, to take these questions down if you want to impact implement them now. But um, what you could do is, I'm going to send you this uh, blog, this blog that I'm reading off as well. And it's it's uh, the blog of the best questions I've come across in my own life. So the first question is, what part of this situation is under my control? So if, this is a brilliant question to ask yourself. It's a very powerful question because very, very little is actually under control, under our control. And this includes external forces like the economy, the weather, political issues. But then you have stuff like COVID-19 lockdown these things are not under our control and we tend to get caught up in these things these are the things that impact us in a, in a big way even though they are outside of our control and the problem is many people see this as a problem but it's not a problem if you focus on what you can control and when you focus on what you can control it's, it's not a weakness it's actually a strength and the reason is because if you focus on what you can control such as your reaction to challenging situations that's the only way you can actively move the needle. That's the only way that you can actually make an impact is focusing on what you can control. Because if you focus on what you cannot control, all of a sudden you're in trouble because you can't do anything about it. So that's the first question. I think it's a really, really powerful question. What part of this situation is under my control? The second question that I want to talk about, <clears throat> and this, this is a funny one, really. It's, it's what are you constantly avoiding? And the funny thing is, this is a really odd paradox because we often avoid what we must do. And this comes back to journaling as well, guys. This is where journaling is really important and writing these questions down because sometimes we think of these questions in our head and we say, yeah, I'm avoiding the health, I'm avoiding eating the right food, I'm avoiding the meditation practice. But if you don't write these things down, and that's the power of writing these down, when you write them down, writing things down is a game changer. It's like you're actually admitting it to yourself and it changes the way that you actually access this information so maybe you need to join a gym maybe you need to eat more healthy maybe you need to reduce your alcohol use or begin a meditation practice or the worst culprit of them all are you avoiding having that difficult conversation with other people it might be conversation in work it might be conversation with your partner conversation with your kids because you don't want to upset them but we often avoid difficult conversations and it's just come into my head just there as well back to, I'm, I'm on a tip, tim ferris love in tonight but it was a quote actually I remember from Tim Ferriss that your, the me measure of success is the amount of difficult conversations you will have in life because that's where you have to have these difficult conversations. It's, it's just part of life and that's where, that's where the good comes and if you can handle them conversations in the right way, it communicates them in the right way, that's where good stuff comes as well. You have to face these things. So it's a really great question to ask and to stop yourself putting these things on the long finger because it will come back to bite you in the ass. And so just ask yourself, what are you constantly avoiding? And act on it then as well. When you write out, act on it and stop avoiding it and put it into practice. The next one that I want to talk about is, and I want to make sure because the screen isn't on here, I want to make sure I'm still on. Yeah, it looks like I'm still on, guys. Um, just because I can't see myself on the screen. Um, so <clears throat> this is one of my favorite questions um, that I ask myself on a very, very, very regular basis. And it's this, what, what would my mentors think about this? So when I talk about this, 
I'm talking about any situation. I'm talking about the problem that you're currently going through. So for me, back in the college, it would have been, how can I get in touch with the, how can I get through to these kids? And if you're struggling in lockdown with your partner, might be that. What would my mentors think about this? Because the fact is, we're easily caught up in today's busy world, or today's COVID-19 world. And when that happens, and we get caught up in our minds, we can't see the forest from the trees. It's like we're the worm in the forest, rummaging through, 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 through the dirt, and we can't see the forest, but we're trapped in the forest. That's where it is. And that's why this question is so useful, because it allows you to take the perspective of someone else and better still, the perspective of someone that you greatly admire. Now, let me just put it across here that um, basically um, a mentor, when I'm talking about mentors, I, I, I have one or two mentors in my life, which is, which is great. I reach out to these people by being bold, which I'd like to do another talk on um, at some stage. But some of my greatest mentors, because I, I don't have access to these mentors on a very regular basis, they're all very busy people. But my mentors that I access on a very regular basis are all dead. There, Marcus Aurelius, he died 2,000 years ago. I love his work. I read his work. And I've gotten into his mind and I, I sort of have an idea of what, what he thinks from his writings. So I'd often ask myself, what would Marcus Aurelius do about this? Eckhart Tolle, who wrote The Power of Now, which had a huge impact on my life. And he's a very spiritual guy. He doesn't get caught up in his own mind. I would say, what would Eckhart Tolle do about this? And it's brilliant because you take yourself out of your own head into this perspective of someone else. And in essence, the next time you're feeling stuck and you do this, instead of looking at the forest floor through the eyes of a worm, you take the perspective of a mentor, a very wise mentor, and it's like looking at the forest through the eyes of a board. You actually shift perspective, you get out of your own head, and you jump into their heads and you say, what would they think about this? This is a really, really, really powerful technique, powerful question to ask yourself when you're stuck in, an, in, in a certain problem. Um, all right, I, lo I love this one and uh, this question as well. What would tomorrow me think? Because the funny thing is, everything happens in a context and our decisions are often reflected by that context. It might be a bad mood, a gloomy environment, or maybe you're surrounded by low energy people and you're feeding into that low, en low energy. So the, the you in the moment might be right, making the right decisions. So it's a great question to ask, what would tomorrow me think? Because all of these things have a bearing on your current mindset. And that's what makes this question so valuable because you're taking yourself out of that. So you could ask, what would tomorrow me think? What would um, two years' time me think? What would 65-year-old me think? And it's that perspective shift again of taking yourself out of the, out the, into a different perspective, like with the mentor. It could be your future self, your former self, whatever serves you best. But just a nice little question there is, what would tomorrow me think? And then you can use the different yous if you want to think about that from a different perspective. So the next one is potentially my favorite question of of all time, that's a bit dramatic, but it's, it's one of my favorite questions, I really love it. And it goes like this, if I am saying yes to this, what am I saying no to? And this is really, really important because it was Steve Jobs, I think, that said that. It says, it's only by saying no that you can concentrate on what's important in life. And when I heard this question, I remember thinking of a Steve Jobs quote, and it, and it helped me to realize the potency and the power of that question. If I am saying yes to this, what am I saying no to? So it, it, Steve Jobs says, it's only by concentrating on what's important in life. So what is important in life? Three things I always looked at is, is the balance of life. So it's your health, mental and physical. So your health, uh, your career, and your relationships. You can break them up into intimate relationships, family relationships. You can break your career down to finance versus passion and purpose and stuff like that. But for, for, it's great to have an idea of what is important to you. So if you're saying yes to going to a coffee, three or four coffee uh, dates or with friends because you, you don't like saying no, you're a bit of a people pleaser, you are actually saying no to the things that are important in your life. So this is a brilliant question that if you're a bit overwhelmed and you have too much on, ask yourself, Right, if, what am I saying yes to? Because if I do that, I'm saying no to the important things in life, be it your relationships with loved ones, your career, your health, the things that you hold most dear. So just be aware that when you're saying yes to one thing, time is, uh, inf is not infinite. Time is a definite amount of time. So when you say yes to one thing, you are actually saying no to something else. And that's what makes this question really, really powerful. 
The next question is, <clears throat> does this align with my mission? Now, not everyone, else, not everyone has a mission in life. A mission is a real dramatic kind of way of, a way of thinking about that. So you could reframe this question in many ways. I think I, I just use mission because it's, it's a bit of a ring to it, I suppose. But you could reframe this in many ways. Does this align with my values? Does it align with my purpose in life? Your values might be honesty, kindness, accountability, doing what you say, open-mindedness, patience, compassion, the different values that I hold there. Uh, your purpose in life might be your family unit, it might be your career, it might be your hobby, your purpose, helping young kids, whatever it might be. And as does it align with my long-term goals? But basically for any situation you're in, or for any actions that you're taking, this is a great question to journal on to say, does this align with my mission? Are your values, your purpose, are your life goals? Because these are the things that should be defining the decisions that we make. But if you're not asking yourself these simple questions, you're not making decisions based on the things you hold most dear, what is actually important to you. So the next time, what I'd suggest is, the next time you're doing something that doesn't feel quite right, ask yourself if it's serving you in life right now. What you're doing, does it align with your mission, whatever that may be? And it's a really potent question to ask yourself, especially if you're feeling, if your gut feeling is thinking, right, is, is this the right thing? Does it align with what you're doing? And just a great good point, I don't think I said it on all of these questions, like you don't have to ask these questions like every week or anything like that. I start to revisit these questions when I'm feeling stuck or sometimes once a month, once a quarter, I revisit these kinds of questions or I might have one or two questions that I ask myself on a regular basis. So pick a couple of questions tonight that really align with, really vibe with you and that, that'd be the thing I'd say because it be a little bit overwhelming when you see all of these different questions. Um, all right, this is a loving one. It's, there's eight questions. There's just one more question, and I'm going to go into a bit of um, another spiel about a different way of looking at questions. So this is the last one. So what's this? Yeah, here's the question. What's the worst that'll happen if I attempt this? Because sometimes the worst that can happen isn't as bad as you think. I was absolutely petrified of public speaking when I started public speaking. I remember nearly having a panic attack forced off. I was petrified of it. But what I realized that this was the only way. I needed to learn how to speak publicly if I could get my message across to people. I wanted to do skill talks. I didn't know COVID-19 was coming along the line. I didn't know I'd be doing online talks, but I wanted to share this message and to do this stuff. And, but I was afraid of my life. But I remember, I, I don't know if I specifically asked this question at the time, I think it was before I heard about this question, but reflecting back on this, I, I think I thought about it retrospectively, or I thought about it at the time when I was thinking about it in this format. And I said, what's the worst that could happen? I remember I used to sweat a lot when I was up on stage doing talks. I said, so I'll sweat, what a big deal. I wear a black short or I wear a black t-shirt and a short underneath. And um, I remember thinking, oh, I might have a panic attack. And then I realized, I've had only a couple of pan attacks in my entire life, and they were years ago when I was in addiction. It's probably not even going to happen. And even if it did, what, what's, the, what's the worst that can happen? It, would, it wouldn't be a great look, but what is the worst that can happen? You'd have a panic attack. You might say, get off the side of the stage and say, right, I need to take a break. That is the worst that can happen. If you got anxious, which is most likely can happen, it was happening to me at the very, very start, some people might notice, but people, most people are up in their own heads anyway. They're not going to be focusing on you, going home, telling everybody about this guy that got anxious up on stage. They actually probably feel sorry for you. I feel feel empathy for you. That's probably the worst that will actually happen. People will feel empathy for you. Is that actually that bad? It's, it's crazy. So what is the, so what way I reframe this as well then now is, well, what is the worst that can happen if I don't do this? Because you can put contingencies in place by reflecting on this question. So it says, if I get anxious, I will do this. And I implemented a meditation practice. And now I have a wonderful relationship with anxiety today from some of the tools that I've implemented in my life. And it's, it, this question is really, is really, really great. Because I, I love this because there's several other advantages to this question. And the funny thing is, is most people follow societal rules without ever questioning why. And obviously some societal rules are there for a reason, like you're going to be breaking the law. But sometimes we follow these societal rules, oh, I shouldn't do that. Like I shouldn't have been, as a former heroin addict, reaching out to people, um, to, like cold mailing CEOs of top companies, very busy people looking for an interview to ask them about their, their life lessons. So the society says that really shouldn't happen. But it's, who cares about societal norms sometimes? And I just think, Follow your passion when people think when, when people think you should play it safe. When the crowd go one way, you go the other. And and if, if you're worried about this, that's where this question is great. You can ask yourself, what's the worst that'll happen if I attempt this? There was many CEOs and there was many leading people that didn't get back to me. What was the worst that can happen? 
I didn't get an email back. That's it. I don't even know if they got the email. That's being quite honest. I never really talked much about it. So that's that's just the, the big one here. What is the worst that will happen if I attempt this? And always think about the other the other side of that, the inverted rule of that is, what's the worst that can happen? Or what, what, what will happen if I don't attempt this? So if I, with my public speaking, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't be doing something I love. I'm so passionate about public speaking. Now. I love going into companies. I love going into skills. I love doing these online talks. I wouldn't be having one of the biggest passions in my life if I didn't attempt this and, and use this question to guide me life. So it's just a really, really, really important question. So I'm going to, um, the time is actually going a lot quicker than I've realized. I just want to look to see how many questions we have in here, guys. Um, Right, we've only one question in the Q&A. It's necessary to join those pencils. Right, there is a little question there as well. I'm going to get into another, because I did see that little question down there at the start. So do I think it's necessary to journal using paper or do you use an app on your phone? I've never, um, in saying that, I didn't actually realize I did, but sometimes if I just think of something, I might, in the notes in the iPhone, I'll actually just put it in and I'll say, oh, I'll write that down. So that's even a form of journal, just something popping into your head. I'd always have um, post-its around. I have post-its everywhere. And with a pen, I have them in my bedroom, I have them in my kitchen, I have them in the car. So as soon as I think of something, I jot it down. Because sometimes you can lose your best ideas or a little thoughts pop into your head. But I use my phone as well. But sometimes I will actually sit down on a pay, uh, sit down on a journal on something. And I will literally put a question in the middle of the page uh, with a pen and paper. I'll write that question and I'll do a brand and I'll do little, uh, little bubbles all around of things that come to mind. And I, I, I chatted about earlier about um, basically a question that another question that I asked myself when I when I got um, uh, obsessed about the art of questions. It was a blog post. I'm going to be sharing this blog post next week, and I think I wrote it about two years ago, um, a year and a half ago. And basically, um, I I was um, I learned about questions and I learned about journal and I started implementing it as a practice. And then I learned about different types of questions. So some questions can be, be specific because if you ask vague questions you will get vague answers now sometimes you're looking for vague answers you're looking for a brain dump but if you want specific answers sometimes it's best to ask specific questions so i was going through a struggle about two years ago about whether i should do me finish my phd or whether i should go and follow me passion because um uh, the speaking buzz and all of this these kinds of things that i was learning that i was really passionate about and i asked myself two specific questions what is it about research that excites me and why am I so ins insistent on, on following my business really quickly? And the specificity was in what excites me about research. So it made me go deep into what excites me about research. It turned out not too much excited me about research, to be quite honest. I loved it for a while. But um, at the PhD, I enjoy certain aspects of it. But there's a lot of coding in it. There's a lot of things that just don't inspire me, I suppose. I enjoy it. I, I, I like to write, but it's, it, it, didn't, it didn't light me up. It didn't light me up. Uh, my favorite quote is, go and do what makes you come alive. Because the world needs people that have come alive. And I love that quote by Howard Thurman. Because if you follow your passion, you come alive. And you do things. And you love what you're doing. And the PhD didn't make me come alive. It, ju it just didn't. Um, I'm still doing it. I'm still finishing. I'll be finished next year. But it doesn't make me come alive. It's a bit more of a graft. And we have to accept that as well. But then I, was, then I focused on, well, what is it about the business? Why do I want to do this so quickly? And it turned out that it was just... It was just a big passion of mine. I got a kick out of it. I love the public speaking. I love reading about it. And I love everything about tools, tactics, and being curious about all of these life lessons, these life skills. I love talking about it to individually to people as well. So what I found was with these two questions, I journaled on these questions. And I says, right, what, what, what is it? I remember I, I mer the odds kind of merged together in the end. And I says, right, what, what, what I got from that, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but it turned out that I needed the PhD to help me to follow my passion in life because the PhD will open up doors for me, bigger doors and talking and, and hopefully on the world stage when I have all of that kind of stuff, that's where I hope to be going. So it was something that I had to do. Funnily enough, one of my mentors, uh, Brian McKernan from Daily Group, um, wrote me an email that just totally changed my perspective on it. He said, that's your North Star, that's what you have to do, that will open up doors bigger than your book will ever do. And he was so right was one of the best emails I've ever received in my life. And it just changed my perspective on it. So probably one of the sole reasons I'm still doing my PhD today was that email. And um, basically, so I'm, I'm, st I'm still doing that. But um, I remember then as well, I've been, I, at the time, I um, another question that I asked myself, and journal on that, re relating to the question down there about journaling on a page. I remember I put on it in the middle of a page, 
what am I passionate about? And it, and it came from this. I was really trying to dig deep into what I'm passionate about. What makes me come alive? Should I pick research? Should I do what, what I love doing? I might be in, having a little tantrum, throwing me toys out of pram because I want to do what I want to do. So it reminded me of the me and addiction a little bit as well. And that was, that was bothering me. And I, for a while before that, I really wanted to write a book. I remember I, it was a different book. It wasn't my memoir, the one that I've written, but I wanted to write another book, another book that I still want to write. And um, I'm going to write Go Forward in the Future. And I'd actually forgotten about that. And I remember writing on the page, what am I passionate about? And it was a brain dump. Everything onto the page, city things, skiing, and um, studying, all oh, crazy things. I was trying to remember what actually jumped out onto the page. And um, money. And I'm actually just doing a brain dump right now and I'm, spit, I'm spitting it all out. So it's not actually what was on the page. Um, so what would have jumped out at me? Um, skiing holidays, mountain climbing, all of these ridiculous things just popping out onto the page that hadn't really anything to do with related to, to what I was actually looking for. Football, something I was passionate about as a kid. All of these crazy things started coming out on the page. Um, writing, I'd start writing blogs at the time. But I remember then writing it all down on the page and I kept on going, I kept on going, I kept on going. And then all of a sudden, in a, in a, the idea sparked in my head, what a book. I want to write that book. And I wrote, I want to write this book in the middle of the page. And what happened then was, what I noticed was that everything was sort of interconnected with that book. When I wrote the book, it would help me speak in career. When I wrote the book, it would help me to connect with other people. Connection was a big part of that. When I wrote that book and it helped me to connect with other people and I'd build a speaking career, hopefully a successful speaking career, I would be able to go ski into the apps. I'd be able to write my other book in a lodge in the apps because I make money from all them things. And it was all interconnected. And I just realized by pushing forward and by journaling and pushing on that question, I was able to connect the dots on many big things in my life. And I never forgot from that day that I wanted to write a book. It was a really big moment in my life. So they are the two big questions that what does this look like if it were easy? And then the other one is, was just really, it was what are you passionate about? That, that's, that was the other question that had a huge, huge impact on, on my life. So um, I'm actually, I'm going to leave it there, guys. I'm going to go into the Q&A. There's still only one question there. So if anyone has any other questions, I'm going to answer. The, oh, I have another question actually um, on a page. But if anyone has any other ones, can you send a pic of your banner? I'd love it on my wall. That's not a question, but I'll do that. Yeah. I'll stick it up in the, uh, I'll say, I can't stand it here, but I will stick it up. If you send me an email, um, I will send you a picture of it in the email. Um, but if anyone has any other questions around other things that I've chatted about, um, life hacks or anything like that, I'm happy to answer them as well. But I'm going to answer this one question that I did get from somebody that came in. And the question is this. Based on my own achievements of what I've done with the book and stuff like that, what practical steps can you advise for achieving a very large goal without boring out or making it become a chore where you will then inevitably give up on it? Two examples might be learning a foreign language or smashing a very difficult exam. And it's, I ask, give examples from your own life. Um, so <clears throat> very large goals. This is a funny one. So if you want practical steps, can advise for achieving a very large goal. And one of the questions, it was, um, it was by James Clear, and it, it, it primed me to actually write that article about all the questions. And it was like, a great question is said, what am I trying to achieve here? Sometimes we don't ask ourselves them questions. So if you're learning a foreign language, that's going, what am I trying to achieve here? Is this something you really want to do? Are you trying to, I don't know, why else would you want to learn a foreign language? Could be just a, a, a bucket list kind of thing. So that, that's something that I'd ask in, in terms of the questions that we we're talking about. Um, but in, for, in, in terms of achieving that, without, to answer this question specifically, without becoming a chore or inevitably giving up on it, what I would say is, is to give yourself time is the big one. And one of the most important, possibly the most important lesson in my life has been that consistency trumps intensity practically every single time. Consistency isn't sexy, it isn't fashionable, but it's always the winner. Small, consistent steps leads to big changes. And that is where the goal is. So what I would say, give yourself time if you're going to be learning a foreign language, but show up every single day and do a little bit every single day. And that's the same for smashing a very difficult exam. Um, the, the, this person asked for examples out of my own life and without um, blowing me on trumpet or anything like that, I've done incredibly well in college. I've got my scholarship based on my results in college as well. And a lot of people actually, um, t t like I wasn't overly intelligent or anything like that. I, I remember getting the IQ done in there in the college as part of one of the assessments for one of the guys. And some of the guys in the class, the psychology class had like near genius level IQs. I wasn't even close to being um, the top of the game in there. 
But what I did do, I started asking me, I, start, I, I would have used them some of the questions that were there. I don't think they specifically used them at the time. But I would have been asking questions like, what am I saying? If I say yes to this, what am I saying no to? So I didn't procrastinate. I don't do procrastination. That's one of the tools that I use in my own life. And to stop yourself procrastinating, there's a great little rule that I use in my own life. There's two little mantras that I use. The first one is, don't negotiate with your own mind. It's my go-to rule. Don't negotiate with, me on, with your own mind. Because when you're procrastinating, you are actually negotiating with yourself. You're sitting in fighting with yourself, procrastinating. Should I do it? Will I do it? I don't want to do it. I need to do it. It's a conversation with yourself. You're negotiating with yourself. So stop the negotiation. That's the fourth thing I'd say. The next thing then is basically, the, it's my go-to rule, the one, two, three, four, five, go rule. And I literally say one, two, three, four, five, go. And I go at go. And I put into action. And I do that all of the time. It's the consistency that's the key piece. And once you act on a consistent basis and you show up every day, all of these big, big, huge projects that you put in your life, they, they, all, they all get done, but over time. It's nearly when you look at the big picture of something, you say, I have to do that, and you have this, this huge idea in your head. That's what puts you off, and that's why you're nearly procrastinating about it in the first place. So if it's a book you want to read or an exam that you have to study for, I will read one page. Stop negotiating with your mind. One, two, three, four, five, go. Read that one page. Chances are you'll read more than one page. If it's studying for a big exam, say, I will study for 15 minutes. Do the same thing. Don't negotiate with your own mind. One, two, three, four, five, go, go and do it. I mean, the 15 minutes are up, what you'll find is that you'll just go on and do a little bit more. So that's not really around questions or anything like that. And, and these questions come into it as well. Like you can say to yourself, what part of the situation is under your control? The actions you take on a consistent basis is under your control. And it's the, the questions work in all different areas. So there's a couple of questions here. How do I deal with doubt? How do you deal with doubt from others surrounding your personal passions? Yeah, I, I don't listen to it, to be quite honest. There's a great line that I love, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And it's really around belief, self-belief. And there's a thing in cognitive behavioral therapy called, it's, it's, it's like changing your beliefs. And it's really the idea is fake it until you make it. And sometimes it's the personal narrative that you have in your own life. So I used to have a story in my life, the narrative that ran my life, and it was, I cannot cope with anxiety, I need heroin to survive. And I acted towards that. My new narrative is, adversity doesn't stop me. It fuels my ability to thrive. Now, the thing is, I don't know if some adversity, if a bus has come my way, I'm sure it'll stop me. It most definitely will. So there's lots of adversity out there that will stop me. But the narrative is, it doesn't stop me. It fuels my ability to thrive. So it depends on the story that you actually have. So that when I ask them that question, how do you deal with doubt from others surrounding your personal passions? What are you actually, it does not, so what, what part of this situation is under their control? The doubt from others is certainly not under your control. It's not even close to being under control. The actions of others is not under your control. But what is under your control is your reaction to the situation, how you think about the situation, the story that you tell yourself, I can do it. That should be the story you tell yourself. So I would try to change the narrative that you have in your head around these personal passions because People, people who often say as well, it's too silly, that's too silly, um, what you call it, it's something that excited you in childhood, that they're the things you should be following. What, what makes you come alive are the things that you should be doing. So I would say ignore other people. Get yourself a little life narrative to help you in them situations when, they, when they're putting you down and fake it until you make it. I don't like the saying, but fake it until you make it actually works. Act your way into it instead of thinking it. Act into it. Action, action before how you think. Because actions actions always actions always win um, alright so the next one what advice would you give to students trying to decide their future what questions should they ask themselves that's a great question and what, what first thing I'd say there is um, that um, that book again Tim Ferriss's book one of the questions in that book from Life Advice 130 the most successful people in the world is what advice would you give a, a student about to enter the real world and there's some sensational answers that I can't remember off the top of my head but that I've shared with other students in that book so that's a great book to go in there so the advice that I would give them to decide their future and what questions they should ask themselves so lots of the questions that, that, I, that I just asked there but the, the, one, the one big one would be, and it really is, so it's like, what are you passionate about? But that's a very vague question. So sometimes you have to get more specific on them questions. So I think 
young people should try to find that passion because if you find your passion, you will never work a day in your life. It's, 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 it's an old cliche, but it's true. You will not work a day in your life if you're doing what you're passionate about. So I would try to get kids to really try to fo ask questions that will help them to find that passion. And some of them questions that I actually ask some of my clients would be, what gave you that fire? What gives you that fire in your belly? What makes you come alive? Is it is it a book? Is it a film? I, I was talking to a guy there the other day, and he was saying, if you go into Easton's or a bookshop or a video shop, what do you walk towards? It might give you a little clues towards your passion. And um, what 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 movies make you cry? What makes you emotional? Because if it's something making you emotional, chances are it's actually making it's something that you're very very passionate about. So have a look at all these little cues and say to these kids to ask themselves, what is it that is making them come alive? What, 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 what aspects of their lives? What do they love doing as kids? But sometimes we, live, we get conditioned out of doing what we really should be doing in our lives because the adult world says we should be doing this but we should be doing what makes us come alive. And I really do believe in that. So that's the question I would give to kids um, to, to ask themselves that question. I'm trying to think of other things as well, other specific questions. There's a, what, my, my big advice in general, it's not so much a question to kids, will be to really get them to learn about the life skills. Because I've been doing lots of seminars to students, especially in my secondary school in St. Declan's, and they, 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 they don't learn the life skills. They go to school and they learn all these geography, history, they're all great subjects and it's brilliant. But all of this stuff is on Google today. We don't need to be memorizing all this stuff. And I think this will change over the next 10, 20 years. But they need to be learning the skills of how to be happy, how to communicate now more than ever with smartphones and stuff like that. How to be emotionally aware, self-aware, how to um, be non-reactive in challenging situations. These are the skills that they need to learn. And these are the skills when I'm hiring people, I will be looking for. And I know top business people out there who are hiring, they're the skills that they're looking for people. They're the, they're the skills that leaders have instead of just these learning about and, and, and ticking boxes and, and getting grades and stuff like that. So that'd be the advice that I would really give to young people. Um, how can I deal with sabotage? I'm not too sure if I actually get that. And I'm thinking that's self-sabotage. Um, how could I deal with self-sabotage? And this really comes back to, I think it's back to the narrative. The, the, the narrative, like, if, if you're asking that question, how can I deal with self, if it's self-sabotage, um, the idea would be that you, you believe you're someone that self-sabotages things. So you really need to change that narrative and you really need to change that through action. And it's, it's, it's the stuff, it's not really an answer, but just actually stop doing it. So how do you deal with self-sabotage? I don't think I can actually answer that question. It's not something that I've ever done myself. I'm going to try to come back to that in a few minutes, but I'm not actually 100% sure if I'm going to answer that question. What is my biggest challenge right now? My biggest challenge right now is time. I have overcommitted. Um, I've overcommitted on several things, which it's, I'm doing okay on that. So I overcommitted on several things. I didn't overcommit. Um, I overcommitted on purpose because I wanted to get a lot done and have a lot of goals. But in the realms of something else has come into my life recently that I want to give a lot of time to, and I didn't really take that into account. So my plan wasn't very good. I didn't have enough white space. So I don't have enough white space. But this thing that came into my life has made me reframe and made me re look at things a little bit differently. <clears throat> and what I've done was I've really, I really had a look at some of the things I was doing. I found, right, this is not serving me anymore. So I'm starting to stop and doing things. I got a VA as well to look after some of the the background stuff with um, with the tech stuff and stuff like that. <clears throat> and that's freed up lots of me time. So time was my biggest challenge. And saying yes, what am I saying yes to? What, when I say yes to this, what am I saying no to? I love podcasts. So saying yes to every podcast that was out there. I love doing podcasts, but I hadn't had the time to do podcasts. So my biggest challenge is really get, getting, paradoxically, he's probably being overly passionate and overly excited about some of the things that, that, that get me going. And I say yes to too many things. So I've really pulled back on that. And I've started saying no in the last few weeks to things that I would really enjoy. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, that would be my biggest challenge right now. And I'm very, very, very specific on what I say yes to at the moment because time is very, very precious. It's very, very limited. It's a resource that we can never get back. We, we just can't. If you're a billionaire with the best life in the world, you would give everything for one more day on earth, one more hour on earth when, when the time is up. Time is precious and guard your time. That's what I'd say there. Um, I have loads of things I want to do in life, but I always have a voice that holds me back, lacking in confidence. How do I get rid of that voice? How do I get rid of my past that holds me back? 
And it's back to this question that keeps coming up. And I might even answer that, that how can you deal with self-sabotage? It's nearly fake it until you make it. There was this thing that I heard in a podcast one time by Terry Crews. Um, it was Terry Crews. I think it was Tim Ferriss' podcast, actually. So I'm all over Tim Ferriss tonight. And <clears throat> it was he had this idea of have, I'm probably going to butcher this, but it's have, do, be. So you want to have something. So let's say with the sabotage, if you want to you have something and not sabotage yourself and have what you want to have, let's just say for argument's sake, a business. You want to develop a business to help people or whatever. So you want to have that and that will earn your money and give you a good life, right? So you, to have that, people think to have that, you have to do certain things and then you become that person. You become the person with the business. But what I found is in the own experience and listening to, the, to, to a couple of things that I've heard I, I, through many people who are very successful in life was you don't to have it. Yeah, it's, it's the reverse way around. The first thing you have to do is be it. So if you want to be a successful business person, you don't get the business and then become it. You be it first. So you act like it in the moment. What would a successful business person do? And then you start acting like that. Then you start doing that. And then you start having that. So the whole thing is paradoxical. It's all in reverse. And it's like a better way of saying fake it until you make it. So if you are lacking the confidence, just start doing what the person with confidence would do. And when you start acting like that, you will start doing these things because you're being that person. And then you will have the things that you want. So it's a really strange way of looking at that. And I, I might have butchered that. But if I have, I think it's, I think I remember the number of this. I think it's 287, podcast 287, on the Tim Ferriss Show, Terry Crews. It's two hours of absolute bliss. It's my favorite podcast of all time. It's absolutely amazing. And he gives a great analogy of this, have, do, be, and it will help with these things. And um, we're nearly running out of time, guys, which is a nice time because it's the last question. So I'm really bad at saving and I want to buy a house. I really want to buy one, but think that I'll never have enough for a deposit. I'm single. I don't have an interest in joining the property market in my 30s. I think procrastinating is a big part of it. My job is going well and challenging, so how am I capable of putting my mind to it? Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's like this action. It's like procrastination. I'm finding procrastination is just a huge, huge thing for people. It's crazy. It's like people know what they have to do, but they don't do it. And it's really strange. And there's no, there's no quick fix for this because procrastination is, is, a, is a monster. What I will actually do next week in my newsletter, there's a brilliant TED Talk. Oh, it's a brilliant... There's a brilliant TED Talk. I'll share it with me newsletter next week. It's a TED Talk by a guy called, is Kevin Kelly? I can't remember now. And it's about the monster of procrastination. He has a blog on it as well. And he's a great way of talking about the master, the master procrastinator or something it's called. But he has about 20 million views. He's a great podcast. And he talks about procrastination in a brilliant way. And <clears throat> I can't remember the ins and outs of it. But he just talks about it, that procrastination is just evil. And it's, it's back to that thing. We're negotiating with ourselves. We're not... Like I can even see reading that that message there as well. You, 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 the, the person is negotiating with themselves. I need to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a person in the authorities. And I think procrastination is a big part. Of it. Procrastination is a huge part of it. And what is procrastination in itself? It's in action. Well, action will define you. If you and I, I, I always say this: if you most people don't act. Most people don't act. So the procrastinators don't act. If you act, you'll shine. But if you act consistently, you will be unstoppable. And I guarantee that it becomes the momentum builds and it's like a snowball rolling down the hill that gains more traction, gains more weight, and it's absolutely unstoppable to stop. When a snowball is moving down a hill like that, the momentum is impossible to stop. And that all comes by consistently taking action. So again, for that last question, I'll say take action Stop negotiating with your own mind. Take that step. Think of the Mel Robbins rule. One, two, three, four, five, go if it's in the moment. Or just go and do it. Or ask yourself that question. What is the worst that can happen if you do it? And then think, what is the worst that can happen if I don't do it? It's nearly stress testing your assumptions. So we all make these assumptions of stuff. So stress test them assumptions and say, right, what will actually happen if I go for this? Rate it on a scale of one to 10. Get numerical with it. Right, that will happen, that will happen. How, how much of an effect will that have in my life? What contingencies can I put in place if that happens? And then what is the worst that can happen if I don't do it? 
and what will come of that and what are the contingencies in place I can put on that. So it's really pulling these things apart, journaling on these kinds of questions because sometimes we ask ourselves these questions when journaling is the action. That's the probably the fourth step that we need to take to put into that action and that's 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 where I would really, I'd really go with that. So I think that's all the questions. There's one more question here guys actually. So how can you truly impact the positive change in your thought process? It's one thing to listen and read about it, but is it, it is quite challenging. And have, what have you done to integrate it into your life fully? It's, it's the question I've, asked or, I've answered already. It's consistent action. It's always consistent action. You've got to act. And building a habit is, is, is a funny thing because it's like build, building habits is hard. It's very hard to break a bad habit. And, but, but it's very hard to break a positive habit. So once you get them habits into place, they are very, very, very hard to break. But it's getting over the line on them positive habits. And to do that, you need to take action and you need to be consistent. Because bringing it back to a biological level, you're creating um, neuron patterns and circuitry in your brain, which negative patterns. So the brain will start to go down the, the, the road of least resistance. And you create circuits that easily flow. So worrying these kinds of things, procrastinating. The brain is, is practiced at these things and it likes doing these things because it saves energy. So you have to go against the grain and you have to create new networks in your brain to create good habits. But what will happen to the old habits is they die away, those circuits will die away, new habits will form and it actually becomes easier to do the new habits. So unfortunately, you need have to get over that first hump. And what I would do for that is use cues like in your environment, leave notes for yourself, use your laptop, use your phone, use accountability partners, tell everyone. There's a thing that I do, I, I say it, I believe it, I tell everyone about it, and then I do it. So I let everyone know to make myself accountable. And that puts more pressure on yourself. It's not for everybody, it works for me. But if you let people know about it, you're making yourself more accountable in the moment. And it can be a really good way of, 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 of pushing that positive change. And what I would say is, is if, if you don't make it first, first time around, don't beat yourself up. Like jump back on the wagon. One of, one of the biggest successful, or one of the most su things that makes people successful with stuff like this is like, if you lose Monday, don't wait for the following Monday. Jump back on the Tuesday. So life will get in the way. There will be bumps on the road. So what you'll do is jump back on the wagon and go back into that habit. Keep on making that positive change. Keep on trying. Keep on plugging away. And eventually you'll get there. I really promise you that. And the best thing is when you get there, you will be like that snowball rolling down the hill positive habits and they are nearly impossible to stop so um i'm finishing up there guys and thanks so much again uh, great engagement um, i really loved it and um if you just could if you can think of uh, ideas other other topics that you love i got a few answers in there it gives me directions to go towards as well and because i love to talk about just different topics that you guys are actually interested in so i'll put it out again in my newsletter next week for other topics and you send me an email and stuff like that as well really really appreciate it so thanks so much for joining me, guys, and I'll chat to you again hopefully next week.